John Major tells a joke, actually he tells more than one joke, but one of his favorite stories is about um, a meeting that he had with President Yeltsin at Downing Street. Um, and President Yeltsin came for the meeting early one morning and was plainly slightly the worse for wear. It's conceivable that he had taken wine the night before. And he sat gloomily in silence on the other side of the cabinet table in number 10. Uh, and John Major, trying to make polite conversation with him, said to him, could you tell me, President, uh, what is the present state of the Russian economy? And President Yeltsin said, good. <laughs> so John Major said, trying to uh, get a bit more out of him, but if you had to say a little more about the Russian economy, uh, how would you describe it? And President Yeltsin said, not good. <laughs> and uh, I guess that quite a lot of what I say in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes about your century rather than mine will sound not good. Um, my wife, uh, who has read The House at Pooh Corner and the other works of A.A. A. Milne more frequently than me, says that uh, when I'm in this vein, I sound a bit like Eeyore without the joie de vivre. Um, and I do just remember that marvelous remark of Eeyore's, um, uh, which goes something like this. When you think things are going to well, go well, just think of all the possibilities. Um, so here goes. Um, in 1992, Francis Fukuyama, the American political scientist, wrote a book called The End of History, by which, to be fair to him, he didn't mean the end of interesting times. What he meant was that he thought that the Western model of political and economic liberalism had triumphed. Uh, and there'd be no more wars, uh, and everyone would sooner or later, become democratic and capitalist. And in the intervening period, things seem for that proposition to have gone downhill rather rapidly. Um, of course, we had from 2001 to 2007 an extraordinary period of economic growth. The fastest ever um, increase in personal uh, income since these records were kept, and the fastest period of global growth for 40 years. But looking back on it, about half that growth was based on the American deficit and on Chinese exports, that fundamental imbalance in the global economy. We had uh, President Bush's unipolar moment. We had uh, the war in Iraq. And then a series of disasters. The uh, draining away of American Western blood and treasure in what Winston Churchill called the thankless deserts of Mesopotamia and then in Afghanistan the humiliation of the princes of Wall Street and the great financial crash. And we're still struggling with the consequences of that and also struggling with the gap between um, promise and reality in the Eurozone. So now, only 20 years after Francis Fukuyama, <laughs> 
it's fashionable to write that the West has had it and the future lies with the BRICS in general, um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Indonesia maybe, South Africa, um, that the uh, sun rises in the east and sets uh, in the west so that America and Europe have had it and the future belongs to particularly Asia. And I'd just like to say a few uh, entirely uncontroversial things about that now, bearing in mind that as chairman of the BBC, I'm no longer al allowed to have any opinions on anything at all. <laughs> um, where to start? I, I grew up um, in a world which was divided between the capitalist West and communism, and a world which was divided between the rich north of the globe and, it's a slight geographical exaggeration, the poorer south. I became Minister for Overseas Development in 1986 when people still caught, talked about the developed rich world and the third world. And the third world had connotations of cheap polyester shirts, um, cheap plastic toys, the ones you'd be slightly alarmed if anybody gave them to your grandchildren at Christmas, um, Soviet era tractors and corruption. And the poor countries, the third world, was intent, first of all, in denying the efficacy of the so-called Western model, but also of ganging up in pursuit of a new international economic order um, with other countries, poor countries, in commodity cartels against the rich North. Well, what happened? The third world became emerging markets. The countries which had once wanted a new international economic order based on commodity cartels got a new international economic order by making their peace with capitalism. And they discovered that what they could do was to manufacture what the rich Western countries wanted cheaper than the rich Western countries could make it themselves. They joined the global economy. Uh, in China, after the reforms introduced by Deng Xiaoping, uh, and in India, after the reforms introduced by Manmohan Singh, uh, after a, uh, a foreign exchange crisis in the early 1990s. Uh, India and China are the biggest countries in the world. Um, China at present the biggest, India the second biggest. Though by the middle of the century, the biggest country in the world will be India, with a younger population than China's. China's population is aging fast. And by the middle of the century, the largest number of the people in the world will be Indian. The second largest number of people in the world will be Chinese pensioners. Why do people look at the moment as though what we're seeing is a serious tipping point? Uh, any of you who've done economic history will know there was a tipping point between about 1450 and 1500 when uh, the West suddenly started to outgrow the East. Now people think things have tipped in the other direction. And to some extent that's true. If you're the biggest country in the world, and your per capita income is increasing very rapidly, the aggregate means that you become more and more important as part of the global economy. When I first went to America on a scholarship from Balliol in 1965, the American economy was worth 38% of the world economy. By the end of the last century, by 2000, 
it had fallen to 30%, and by 2010 to 23%. In 2000, the Chinese economy was one-eighth the size of America's. Last year, it was 41% the size of America's. So you've seen, as China and India have uh, joined the world economically, you've seen their size and their extraordinary growth rates change the balance between America and Europe and India and China. Now, does that mean um, that uh, America and Europe have had it? Um, certainly, the United States today has a gridlocked political system, a deadlocked political system, um, not only because of the uh, ideological standoff between Democrats and Republicans, but also because of the extraordinary check on an executive which is provided by the Supreme Court and by a constitution which was designed to deal with a Hanoverian king in the 18th century. So America finds it very difficult now to deal with some of its big uh, structural problems like uh, the size of its deficit, um, a deteriorating infrastructure. I say to Americans sometimes, and they don't believe it, that broadband speed is um, in America is 29th out of 34 in the OECD, and it's actually faster in Greece. Falling secondary school standards, all the sort of things which every um, serious American politician knows need to be tackled, but which the American political system finds it very difficult to cope with. But America still has complete military dominance of the global commons land, sea, air, space. America still has an extraordinary ability to turn uh, higher education's R&D into uh, very profitable technology. It still attracts a huge number of the world's best and brightest, partly because it's got uh, 42 of the world's 50 best university, universities. I just say one thing in parenthesis, as the chancellor of this university, in the last global rankings, we came second. We came second to Caltech. Caltech is a great university, but it's a boutique university. You couldn't go and go to a Caltech and read French or Latin or German. <laughs> and the other interesting thing about Caltech, which came first, is that there are more American postgraduates at Oxford than there are at Caltech. True. Indeed, there are almost as many Americans in full at Oxford as there are at Caltech. Not being rude about Caltech, I'm just underlining <laughs> the importance <laughs> of our role as a global university. And of course, um, if you're reading medicine here, you're reading medicine at the greatest uh, medical sciences university in the world. Um, I suspect that you're probably, if you're reading maths, reading maths at the best university uh, for studying that subject in the world, though we don't yet get sufficient credit for it. America attracts huge numbers of the world's best and brightest because of its um, quality education, at, at tertiary level at least. Um, and I was in Stanford uh, 10 days ago, and in Stanford, um, they were telling me that three-quarters of all science PhDs written in America this year will be written by foreigners. Not surprisingly, half the startups in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley are owned, started by foreigners or first-generation immigrants to America. Not surprisingly, America still with just over 5% of the world's population, has, even though it's been declining, about 25%, just under 25% of the world's output. 
for 130 years, it's had between uh, 20 and 30 percent of the world's output. America remains the only country which matters everywhere. It's much more insular than white man might suppose. Julian Barnes, the novelist, has a very good line. He says, if you want to see your own country disappear, you go to America and you open an American newspaper. But it does matter everywhere. It's what Madeleine Albright once called the indispensable nation. Europe. Uh, Europe isn't quite as isn't quite as clapped out as most Europeans um, seem to think. With about 7% of the world's population, we're still responsible for about 23% of output. Um, we're the biggest exporters in the world at 18%. We've actually managed to cope better than either America or Japan with the extraordinary surge in Chinese exports and other exports from um, the so-called BRICS. We've created an extraordinary single market. Um, we've shared sovereignty and policy in a number of quite sensitive areas. Um, and we've probably still got the best quality of life in the world. But we're incredibly conservative with a small c. And there's a great line in what I think is the best political novel in Europe, The Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa. And one of the characters in The Leopard, Prince Tancredi, says something, I haven't quite got it right, but says something like this, things have to change in order to remain the same. And in Europe, we're extremely reluctant to face up to that, extremely reluctant to borrow a Chinese phrase, extremely reluctant to smash the iron rice bowl. And there are two issues which I think are real, a real worry for um, Europeans. The first is that we have an aging and falling population. In the 19th century, part of the reason for Europe's dominance was that our share of the world's population increased from a fifth to a quarter. In the last 50 years, our share of the world's population is in, has fallen from a fifth to a tenth. And Europe will actually see a fall of about 20% in its population between now and the middle of the century, with the sharpest falls coming in the most Catholic countries, Poland, Italy, Spain. Not sure what that tells one, but it tells one something. Um, so unless we increase our underlying growth rate, we face the prospect of a falling share of the world's population, of the world's trade, and of the world's output. And that's not obviously a description of um, an important power. So we have to make reforms that will enable us to grow sustainably, I underline, more rapidly. But the political system seems to be incapable of delivering that. The Prime Minister of Luxembourg, who may not be a household name in your households, <laughs> even in his own household, <laughs> um, has been chairman of the Euro Group of Finance Ministers for some years. And a about 18 months ago, somebody said to him, why aren't Europe's leaders doing more to implement the sort of reforms which you must know are necessary in order to increase your growth rate? And Mr. Juncker replied, you don't understand, he said, it's not that we don't know what we have to do, it's just that we don't know how we'd get re-elected if we did it. <laughs> That's called leadership. <laughs> The second issue, which is a worry for Europe, um, I think there's a huge gap between European rhetoric <coughs> and what Europe is capable of delivering. Um, now, I speak as somebody who is widely regarded uh, by 
great organs like the Sun, uh, Daily Telegraph, Daily Mail, as a European fanatic, a federast. Um, so w what I'm saying perhaps will surprise you. But the reason for the creation of the euro was political. And the economic justification was that it would promote convergence between the richer countries and more hard-working countries in the north of Europe and the less rich countries in the south of Europe. In fact, far from promoting convergence, it seemed to promote divergence. The proposition today is that through austerity, um, divergence can be turned into convergence. Uh, in order to have a currency union, uh, European countries now say they are going to sign up to a fiscal union, and a fiscal union must involve transfers from some countries to others, and a transfer union will require a political union in order to give it credibility. So, at some point, the Greeks will become German, um, and until that point is reached, the German taxpayer will be happy to bail out, Germany, uh, bail out Greece or Italy or Spain or any of the others. Well, maybe uh, you'll detect a certain skepticism. Um, Harry Truman, the American president, used to have on his desk a sign which said, the buck stops here. On the other side of the sign, it said, I'm from Missouri. <laughs> and there isn't a European buck. And I rather doubt whether there will be, because we're not from Missouri, but we're from France or Germany or Italy or Spain or Greece. When are members of the Assemblée Nationale going to be happy about German parliamentarians determining the size of tax cuts or public spending cuts or tax rises in France? I think I know the answer to that question. So I am not hugely optimistic, or as Douglas Hurd would say, hugely optimistic about um, the likelihood of an early end to the Eurozone crisis. So, Asia, India and China. What's happened in India and China is to a considerable extent, as I tried to argue earlier, a turn of history's wheel. After all, in 1820, China and India represented between them 50% of the global economy. And China has been the largest economy in the world for 18 out of the last 20 centuries. India today has a growing middle class. It's been incredibly successful in information technology, pharmaceuticals, back office outsourcing, um, car manufacture. Uh, it's, uh, India has been very successful at establishing um, global brands, big corporations that uh, are gold standard. Um, it's been very good at hustling. But India faces some awful problems. There is, a, there is political paralysis at the center. There is huge social inequity, a growing middle class, yes, but also the largest number of very poor people in any country in the world. There is social turbulence with the Naxalite uprising, which has affected about 200 local, local government districts in India. Uh, levels of corruption uh, which have turned much of the middle class against the institutions of representative government. At the last count, I think there were three um, chief, justice, chief justices who were helping the police with their inquiries. 
um, and appalling infrastructure. So India faces big problems. I find India, in many respects, the most interesting country in the world, and I'm a huge India groupie. Um, but I just don't see India becoming a superpower anytime soon. And nor do um, I serious Indian historians like Ramachandra Guha, who's written not only uh, one of the best books on cricket, uh, but the best book on Indian history since uh, Gandhi. So China, it's the 21st century in China's back pocket. I first went to China in 1979. In 1979, China exported in a year what China exports today in a day. In 1979, 1980, China was manufacturing in a year what China now manufactures in a fortnight. China is now the largest manufacturer in the world, the largest uh, of any individual country, the largest exporter. Huge increase in the amount of energy which China has to use and import. And you can go on with the gee whiz statistics until the crack of doom. China now manufactures more um, sombreros than Mexico. <laughs> As Michael Caine would say, not a lot of people know that. But I think China faces three existential problems. First of all, corruption. Uh, with one very famous old Maoist saying a few years ago, unless we deal with graft, the party will lose support of the people. But if it deals with graft, people will stop joining the party. Secondly, China has to change its economic model, which was heavily um, based on manufacturing exportable goods at cheap prices. From 1997 for a decade, a period of fantastic growth in China, the proportion of the national economy which was taken by wages fell from 53 to 40%. It's an extraordinary definition of communism. And Chinese leaders now know they have to increase consumption, they have to allow wages to go up, and as that happens, so it has an impact on Chinese competitiveness. So the Americans are now starting to talk about a uh, revival in their manufacturing base, not least the manufacture of cars. And thirdly, there is, I think, an argument that goes on um, in the leadership, um, which is really an, an example of, um, to borrow a phrase, one party, two factions. I think the argument in the leadership goes like this, that unless one group says, if the party continues to give up control over the economy, sooner or later, it will lose control of the state. And the other group says, but if the party doesn't give up control over the economy, state-owned enterprises, <laughs> politicization of credit and so on, we won't grow as fast, we won't produce as many jobs, and in those circumstances, the party will certainly lose control over the state. And it seems to me that China's dilemma is that both those propositions are probably entirely true. And the challenge for the leadership, the challenge for the new leadership um, is, and heaven knows what their views are on anything, nobody knows. Um, you may feel you know too much about Governor Romney's views and President Obama's, but you certainly don't know anything about um, Xi Jinping's views. Um, the, the real problem for the next generation of Chinese leaders is how they square that circle. And I want to make one point which I think the Chinese ambassador would definitely agree with. It is not remotely in our interest that China fluffs that test. It's not remotely in our interest that China should do badly. It's in all our interest that China should go on doing well. For China to do badly would be a real disaster for all of us. If you think China doing badly is good for the world, 
Just look back at the 1920s and 1930s, when, among other things, China was being pillaged by Japan and uh, torn apart in a civil war. So I hope that China gets through the next few years uh, in good health and stable. But I don't think that there is a Chinese model there which is going to be transported or translated to the rest of the world. So my cop-out position is that the 21st century, apart from, of course, belonging to you, <laughs> the 21st century doesn't belong to America or Europe like the 19th and 20th centuries, and I doubt whether it be belongs to India or China either. There's a very good book by, an I think he's an Australian, called Patrick Harris, and with Patrick Smith, called Somebody Else's Century. And uh, I think the 21st century probably believes, belongs to those political systems which are best able to combine inclusive politics with inclusive economics. And I suspect as well that during your lifetime, you're going to think much more about cities and regions where things are prosperous and stable rather than countries. Which brings me back to Eeyore. When somebody told Eeyore that there was a bad weather forecast, he said, well, at least there hasn't been an earthquake recently. <laughs> which is my optimistic view. <laughs>